The compilation of Final Fantasy VII has slowly been expanding the iconic RPG's timeline since the original game's release back in 1997. Combined with the remake trilogy, the timeline now spans nine games, one movie, and a handful of tie-in books, all of which amounts to a rather confusing chronology of events. But Square's revered franchise has a deep well of engaging lore that stretches into an in-game past that goes over 2,000 years back. In short, there's a lot of backstory. But how does it all tie together? Well, with the new remake trilogy toying with the continuity of the original game's timeline, it all gets a little bit confusing. Without getting too much into the weeds of it right away, Final Fantasy VII Remake effectively splinters off into an alternate timeline, creating a parallel universe of sorts after the events of Crisis Core. That's a hyper simplification of it, so let's get into the breakdown of it. Hey, my name's Adam and there is no better time than now to dive back into the lore of Final Fantasy VII. So join me as I break down and explain the franchise's timelines. Before we get stuck into the bulk of the timeline, first up is a little ancient history lesson. The compilation of Final Fantasy VII games takes place on a planet known as Gaia which houses a life stream that gives a steady flow of spiritual energy to the land and its many inhabitants. This life stream will eventually be harvested by the Shinra Company. As I mentioned, we start with Gaia's ancient history, 2000 years before the events of Final Fantasy VII to be precise, when a meteor of sorts crash lands into the north pole of the planet, carrying with it an alien creature who will later become known as Genova, but again, I'm getting ahead of myself. The alien stumbles away from its crash site and eventually encounters a race of people known as the Cetra. Unluckily for the Cetra people, they become infected by a virus of sorts from the alien, and their race is pretty much wiped from history. The few remaining Cetra manage to imprison the alien entity within its original crash site, where it would languish away, forgotten almost entirely by the growing population of humans on Gaia. Anyway, we jump forward a good two millennia to the in-game 20th century. Here we catch up with the aforementioned Shinra Company, who have discovered the ability to harvest Gaia's livestream as Marco Energy. This discovery leads to a golden age of technological advancement, which is capped off with the crown jewel of the Shinra Company, the creation of the city of Midgar, which is built between MEGL 1969 and 1976. In the wake of all Shinra's technological ambitions, a war breaks out in MEGL 1985 between Shinra and the Wutai people, who resist Shinra's attempts to install a marker reactor within the Wutai territories. This sparks a full-on conflict between the two nations, which naturally has dire consequences across Gaia. For starters, the reactors back in Midgar go into full-on overdrive to compensate for the lack of Marco energy that was to be harvested in Wutai. This further widens the gap between the rich and poor classes of the mega city, and inevitably leads to the decline of the life stream in Gaia. And it's these turbulent times that many of the key players across the Final Fantasy VII timeline are born into, namely Oh, hello. Namely, <laughs> Katora. <laughs> Namely, series protagonist Cloud Strife, Tifa Lockhart, and Aerith Gainsborough, the latter of whom is actually a descendant of the ancient Cetra race, but more on them later. Are you going to stick around? The first game on our timeline is one of the more recent entries into the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, and that's the 2021 Battle Royale The First Soldier. Set roughly 20 years before the main events of Final Fantasy VII in MEGL 1989, the first soldier chronicles the Shinra Company's training regime for its elite force known as Soldier, who are humans enhanced with Marco energy. Here various soldier candidates train against each other, as well as a menagerie of giant monsters, within the safe confines of virtual reality. And well, that's about it. However, the story of the first soldier is expanded upon in the RPG anthology Ever Crisis, which while telling a brand new story for the compilation, also depicts the origins of one of the series' key antagonists, Setheroth. The bulk of the first soldier takes place in MEGL 1992, at the peak of the Wutai War, within the region of the Rador Archipelago. The main story follows the exploits of three soldier recruits, Glenn Lodbrock, Matt Winsword and Lucia Lin, who have been dispatched to the region to wipe out the hostile locals. The trio are eventually joined in the heat of battle by Setheroth, who promptly destroys half of the Rador forces in one fell swoop. 
Here we learn that Setheroth, who has a complex and troubled backstory, which I'll touch on in parts throughout this timeline, is there to take charge as a new genetically modified rank of soldier. Across their adventures together, Setheroth admits that his time with Glenn, Matt and Lucia is the first time he has had fun in his life, and that's really all you need to know about this tragic lad right now. He caps this off by showing the trio a picture of a woman known as Lucrecia Crescent, who unbeknownst to him is actually his mother. Yep, there's a whole heap of hurt in this young lad's future. Anyway, the Quartet complete their mission on the archipelago, which is the vicious elimination of the entire Adoran people. Yep. Are we the baddies? Right, this is where our timeline starts to get a little messy, as the next couple of entries before Crisis and Crisis Core actually overlap one another. For the sake of clarity, I'm going to go through each game separately, starting with the events of Before Crisis. Bearing in mind that Before Crisis was a mobile game released nearly 20 years ago, and only in Japanese, I won't be able to delve too deeply into the game. Regardless, it takes place roughly six years before the events of Final Fantasy VII and just after the conclusion of the Wutai War. The war has left the world in a bad state, and Shinra used this to their advantage to take a strong economic foothold with their firm grip on the planet's harvested energy force, Marco. Rising up to meet them are a rebel group who call themselves Avalanche, who see right through Shinra's bullshit and aim to take them down a peg to avert environmental disaster. Despite Shinra's evil outlook and the fact that players would be familiar with Avalanche as the rogue group of rebels from the original Final Fantasy VII, Before Crisis sees you take control of a group of 11 elite Shinra fighters who are known as the Turks. The game largely chronicles the emerging battle between Avalanche and Shinra, with the Turks frequently being dispatched to combat the pesky rebels. Naturally, there are a handful of cameos from wider series players like Sethoroth, Cloud and Tifa, as well as Shinra soldier Zack Fair, who will play a much larger role in our next entry in the timeline. Speaking of... As I mentioned previously, the bulk of Crisis Core takes place concurrently with Before Crisis, and also kicks off right at the end of the Wutai War. In fact, the game's central character, up-and-coming soldier-in-waiting Zack Fair, is in attendance for the very last battle of the war. He and his mentor, first-class soldier Angeal, are dispatched to Wutai to end the war once and for all amidst a disturbance in the soldier ranks. You see, it turns out another first-class soldier, by the name of Genesis Rhapsodus, has gone rogue and betrayed his Shinra comrades. And while Zack and Angeal fight the last battle of the war, they discover a pair of soldiers that have been cloned slash copied from Genesis. Hmm, mysterious. While Zack is saving their superior, Director Lazard, good lad soon to be bad lad, Sethoroth turns up and informs Zack that Angeal has turned his back on the soldier ranks as well. Has betrayed us as well. No way! Unable to process the betrayal of his mentor, Zack throws himself into his soldier duties, and his next mission takes him to Angeal's hometown to investigate the mysterious motives behind the first class soldier's defection. There he meets Angeal's mother, who's not long for this world, as her dear son seemingly offs her shortly after her intro to the story. Well, that's what Zack believes, but as we find out later on, she actually kills herself. Naturally, Zack is pretty shocked at his mate's supposed matricide and confronts Angeal, but all of this is a moot point as the original turncoat himself, Genesis, is also in attendance at this unhappy family reunion, and promptly summons the Dragon King himself to see off the rookie soldier. Zack manages to fight off the summoned demon and makes it away from Angeal's hometown shortly before Shinra bombs it to Kingdom Come. Following this baptism of fire, Zack is promoted to first class, and he's rewarded with protection duties at Shinra's HQ when Genesis launches an attack on the Midgar building. Sethoroth and Zack lead the counter-attack and successfully fight off the forces of Genesis, and in the aftermath they discover a lead into the motives behind Genesis and Angeal. You see, it turns out that both of the former first class soldiers were born out of Project G, which was led by a Shinra scientist called Dr. Hollander. The project, which is actually part of the wider Genova project, yep, remember that name, had the aim of splicing human DNA with that of the alien being Genova, who I mentioned back at the beginning of the video. While Shinra originally believed Genova to be part of the ancient Cetra race in a bid to create a human Cetra hybrid, the project eventually led to failure, and even led to an alarming level of degradation in its two subjects, which is why Genesis is sporting one black wing. 
Angeal on the other hand has a fetching white wing, which Sax states is less monstrous and more like the wing of an angel. Angeal disagrees with his soppy mate and sends him hurtling down from the Midgar Heights into the slums below. And it's here where Zack bumps into one of the series' most beloved characters, Aerith Gainsborough, who's busy attending to her flower garden in a derelict church, as you do. Anyway, the pair bond while touring through the Sector 5 slums, all before Zack is called back to duty, the duty being another attack from Genesis, who has targeted another Shinra scientist called Dr. Hojo in a bid to find a cure for his degradation. Zack, aided by Sethiroth and Angeal, who clearly can't decide which side he's on, beat back the forces of Genesis and saves the day once again. Anyway, it's time for Zack to meet another Final Fantasy VII icon, as he teams up with Cloud Strife on a mission to the frozen wastes of Medeoheim to recon one of Genesis's potential hideouts. And so begins the makings of a beautiful friendship between the two spiky-haired lads. Their chopper crashes en route and the team have to journey the rest of the way by foot. They land upon the secret Genesis base and lo and behold, the bad lad himself is there. Zack, with the support of Cloud, takes Genesis down a few pegs, and weakened from battle, the red-coated super soldier seemingly ends his own life by flinging himself into the abyss. The epic duels don't end there though, as next up is a fight for the ages, Zack vs Angeal, with the latter evolving into a four-legged monstrosity. Zack still wins out though, and as his brother-in-arms dies in his um, arms, Angeal gifts him his prized blade, the Buster Sword. Zack heads back to base with Dr. Hollander, who's in league with the late Genesis and Angeal, and a sketchy piece descends around Midgar. Zack is sent for a little R&R &R at Costa del Sol, but his vacation is cut short with a trio of earth-shattering revelations. Well, it's cut short by some Genesis clones on the beach, which he fights off with a parasol, but that leads to the three revelations. Revelation numero uno is the possibility that Genesis isn't actually dead, hence the Genesis clones still knocking about. Revelation number two is that his dear pal Aerith is actually under surveillance by the Shinra company, as they suspect that she's an ancient, i.e. a descendant of the Setra race from right back at the beginning of this timeline. Revelation number three occurs when Zack is on a mission trying to track down Dr. Hollander. Zack discovers that the director of Soldier, Lazard, is actually a traitor. Lazard is in league with Dr. Hollander, who uses the attack of the Genesis clones as a cover to escape. This last revelation leads Sethiroth to question his place within Shinra, but he remains committed to his soldier brethren for now. Anyway, all of this pales in comparison to what happens next. On a routine mission to Nibelheim, which is the home of Cloud Strife, Zack and Sethiroth discover an even more earth-shattering revelation. A revelation that has huge implications on the rest of the FF7 timeline. You see, the team discovers the remains of another mad science project at the Marker Reactor, one that hints towards the origins of Sethiroth, as the central tank sports the name of his mother, Genova. Yeah, there's that alien's name again. Anyway, Genesis handily turns back up to explain, stating that there was a second project after Project G, simply titled Project S, which saw Genova's DNA planted into the unborn child of the scientist Dr. Hojo, and his partner at the time, Sethiroth's real mum, Lucrecia Crescent. Anyway, Sethiroth is the unholy creation of this experiment, and while he doesn't have the all-consuming power of Genova, he's a superior creature to the likes of Genesis and Angeal, and doesn't degrade either. This naturally sends Sethiroth off to do a little soul-searching, and he locks himself away with Dr. Hojo's old files to figure out just what the hell is going on. And, well, he kind of goes a little mad. All that work and no play makes Sethiroth go something-something. Anyway, he misinterprets his mum as one of the ancient Setra people as a result of Shinra's original misguided data, and he himself misguidedly blames humanity for their demise. And well, this leads him to burn Nibelheim to the ground, killing much of the population. Zack races after the rampaging Sethiroth and confronts him at the marker reactor, only to be defeated. Ah! And in a final bid to defeat old Seth, Zack implores Cloud to stop him. Cloud, absolutely seething with rage because of the death of his mother, actually manages to take the fight to Sethiroth, and he sends both the silver-haired monster and part of Genova's remains into the flowing life stream of the planet. Whew. For their gargantuan efforts trying to stop Sethiroth, Zack and Cloud are taken into custody by Dr. Hojo, who experiments on them by implanting some of Sethiroth and Genova's DNA into their bodies, all in a bid to test out a new theory of his known as Reunion. 
It's all a bit of a bust for the Mad Doctor, and the pair are left to cool off in some back to like tanks for the best part of four years. When Zack awakes, he's confused as to where and when exactly he is, but he saves his comatose friend and ventures out into a rebuilt Nibelheim. While Zack is able to withstand the Marco energy coursing through his body, Cloud remains in a pretty bad way, prompting Zack to find him some new clothes to get him out of his Marco soaked digs. Anyway, the pair are now fugitives from Shinra, and as a result, one of their old Turk allies is sent out to recapture them. But she opts to let them stay free, and even gifts Zack a motorbike with a sidecar for the sick boy that is Cloud. Zack takes the bike and rides them straight back to his hometown to see his parents, but he instead has an unfriendly reunion with a whole host of people from throughout Crisis Core, chief among them Dr. Hollander, who's become a Genesis clone himself and is promptly defeated, and Director Lazard, who's now an Angeal clone and has taken on some of Angeal's better known traits, as he tells Zack he now has a desire to save the planet. Zack, the Lazard slash Angeal hybrid, and Cloud all travel back to Angeal's hometown to finally confront Genesis at his childhood lair. After defeating Genesis in two rounds of battle, Zack is finally victorious, and he carries Genesis' unconscious body above ground, and it's here during a reenactment of the Book of Loveless that Lazard finally dies and drifts off into the life stream. Zack and the still comatose Cloud leave Genesis, who's nabbed by a pair of mysterious soldiers, more on them later, and they venture off towards Midgard. But in the desert wastes, the Shinra military finally catch up to them, and despite a valiant last stand, Zack is mortally wounded and left to die by his former comrades. And it's at this point that Cloud starts to shake off his Marco poisoning, and come back to the land of the living. He comes to Zack's side for his final moments, and Zack gifts him his buster sword, and tells the blonde recruit that he will be his living legacy. And with those final words, Zack shuffles off this mortal coil to join Angeal in the life stream. Cloud, meanwhile, Buster Sword in hand, walks the deserts en route to Midgard, and due to the overwhelming ordeal he's been through in the past few years, completely blocks it all out. And taking on Zack's words a little too literally, and as a result the sheer toxicity of the Marco poisoning, he starts to take on certain traits of his late friend, essentially creating a new personality for himself. And well, that pretty much leads us straight up to the OG that started this mad timeline. Yep, we finally reached the events of the OG Final Fantasy VII, which follows on right after the ending of Crisis Core. And the game kicks off with a bang, literally, as a disgruntled Cloud Strife joins forces with the aforementioned Avalanche eco-terrorist group who are led by the gruff, arm-cannon-wielding Barrett Wallace and Cloud's old childhood friend Tifa Lockhart. The group of freedom fighters successfully blow up a Shinra Mako reactor right within the heart of Midgar, before a second follow-up attack goes awry, and Cloud finds himself stranded in the slums below. Perhaps by chance, or even some higher power, he falls right through the roof of Aeris Flowerfield Church, much like Zack did before him and Cloud strikes up a friendship with Aerith as he protects her from Shinra goons. Shinra naturally want revenge for all the attacks on their reactors, and they enact this by collapsing part of the upper city down onto the slums below in a bid to destroy Avalanche's base, killing plenty of the eco-operatives and a fair few civilians in the process. And after having surveilled her for the best part of the last few years, Shinra finally go the full hog and capture Aerith to get her to reveal all the Cetra secrets about a fabled promised land, which is said to be brimming with life stream energy ready to be harvested. Cloud, Barrett and Tifa, the only remaining members of Avalanche left alive, mount a rescue mission and successfully save Aerith, along with a giant fiery red beast called Red 13. While moving through the Shinra HQ, Cloud clocks the headless remains of Genova, which triggers a series of weird flashbacks within his memories, and this uneasy past comes back to haunt him in a bigger way when Setheroth rocks back up. Presumed dead for the past five years, Setheroth is back and on a warpath with, well, everyone. He starts by killing the president of Shinra, which handily gives Cloud and the team the diversion they need to get the hell out of Midgar. With Setheroth having re-announced himself quite dramatically, Cloud vows to take revenge on the former soldier for the destruction of his hometown Nibelheim, as per the events of Crisis Core. Cloud launches into a recollection of the disaster, albeit one that is slightly abridged as a result of Cloud's memories being merged with Zack's. Tifa shares Cloud's hatred for Setheroth due to the fact that her father was killed during his attack on Nibelheim, and Aerith has a vested interest too on account of Setheroth's connection to the ancient Cetra race. 
And so the team venture off across the lands of Gaia to track Sethroth down. On their travels they meet a vast range of colourful characters, plenty of whom join their party. Alongside Red 13 there's Kate Sith, a talking robot cat, Sid Highwind, an ambitious high-flying pilot, Yuffie Kisaragi, a young ninja from the Wutai people, and Vincent Valentine, a former Turk who's now gone rogue and sleeps in a coffin. Yeah, he's basically an emo vampire. Anyway, as this ragtag team travels the lands, they piece together the truth behind past events. For starters, Aerith discovers that Sethoroth isn't a descendant of the Setra people, which means that Aerith is the last remaining member of the Setra. The group also come into contact with a host of Sethoroth clones, which they learn are all part of Dr. Hojo's reunion theory experiments that happened in the wake of the Nibelheim destruction. And all of this leads to the team discovering Sethoroth's ultimate plan, to use a powerful form of materia known as the Black Materia to summon a meteorite down to Gaia. Short of destroying the planet, Sethoroth's plan involves using the meteorite to create a wound in the planet to unearth a fresh supply of Gaia's lifestream, which he'll harvest for himself to turn into an all-powerful god. Anyway, it turns out that the Black Materia is actually a great big bloody temple, known as the Temple of the Ancients, and to actually turn it into a usable substance, someone needs to sacrifice themselves within the temple itself. The noble cat robot Kate Sith volunteers himself to prove his loyalty to the group after they discover that he's actually being controlled by a lad called Reeve and has joined the party to spy on them. And because, well, he's a robot, and his body is destroyed as the temple turns into the Materia. With the Materia in their grasp, the group finally seek out Sethoroth, who is able to manipulate Cloud into giving him the all-important Black Materia. Not only this though, Sethoroth nearly manages to manipulate Cloud into killing Aerith, but Cloud is able to refuse at the last minute. And as the old saying goes, if you want a job well done, do it yourself. And Sethoroth takes this to heart, impaling Aerith and killing her. Yep, that moment brought hundreds of gamers to tears in the late 90s, and for good reason too. To make matters worse, the Sethroth the gang have been chasing is actually a form of Genova, which the team have to defeat, and with Genova out of the way for now, they mourn the death of the dearly departed Aerith. From here, the team travels north towards the epicentre of where all of this kicked off 2000 years ago. At the Icicle Inn, they learn the truth behind Aerith's history, namely her ties to the Setra race and Shinra's subsequent attempts to contain her and her mother, who sadly dies when Aerith is young. The team also learn the history behind Genova and the meteorite that crashed at the North Pole, which leads to another fight with Sethoroth slash Genova at the Crater Impact Site. And yet more past revelations are unearthed when Sethoroth coaxes out the truth from Cloud about his past and his version of events during the Nibelheim disaster, and it's revealed that Cloud has confused his own memories with those of Zax, which was a massive revelation at the time, even if I've spoiled it already during this timeline. Anyway, it turns out that Sethoroth's true body is housed within a cocoon at the North Crater, and when he summons the meteorite down, it triggers a lot of things at once. Firstly, it awakens the planet's weapons, giant freaking monsters who are immensely powerful and were created by the planet 2000 years ago to protect itself from Genova. Secondly, it starts to destabilise the crater floor beneath the team, and Cloud and the Sethoroth cocoon fall down into the livestream of the planet below. Amidst all the chaos, Tifa is knocked out and Barrett is captured while attempting to rescue his unconscious teammate, and this brings Act 2 of Final Fantasy VII to a close. Into the third act we march, and the end of the world is nigh. Sethoroth's summoned meteorite looms large over Gaia, and everything and everyone is going a little crazy as a result. Sethoroth has barricaded himself in at the North Crater, and as the weapons can't get at him, they start attacking Shinra Marco reactors instead. A resurrected cat Sith, he is a robot after all, leads a rescue attempt to save Barrett and Teetha, and the gang then all start the search for Cloud. They find the poor lad suffering from another bout of Marco poisoning, with his body having washed away from the North Pole crater site within the livestream. And his hate affair with the livestream continues when Medil, the town he's recovering in, is destroyed by one of the planet's weapons, which triggers an earthquake throwing him and Tifa back into the livestream. And it's here where Tifa learns the truth about her childhood friend, a truth that I've largely already regaled during the Crisis Core section of this video. 
So to keep it short, she learns that Cloud was never a first class soldier, that he was present at the Nibelheim destruction as an infantryman, that he and Zack were experimented on by Dr. Hojo, and that Cloud and Zack's memories have been fused within Cloud's subconscious. Amidst all these character revelations, we also learn what happened to Sethiroth after his fateful encounter with Zack and Cloud. Basically, his body dissolved amidst the livestream, but his consciousness remained, and learned all about the ways of the Setra. From there, he rebuilt a body for himself within the cocoon at the North Crater, and once he had gained possession of the remains of Genova at Shinra HQ, he assimilated that into his image as well, and used its power to gain the Black Materia. Gosh, this is a lot to take in, even for a second time. Once they make their way out of the livestream, Cloud and Tifa rejoin the main party and quickly learn the dire circumstances the planet is in. The meteor is still en route, and the team rally around to figure out a plan of action, and it's here that they learn of Aerith's attempts to stop Sethiroth early in the game. You see, it turns out that Aerith planned to summon a powerful magical spell known as Holy, which would help counter the meteor and save Gaia. And while she was successful in summoning the spell, Sethiroth has managed to keep it at bay all this time. To make matters even more interesting, one of the weapons has set its sights on Midgar, causing chaos at Shinra HQ. The leader, Rufus Shinra, has moved one of the company's biggest cannons to Midgar in preparation for a climactic battle with Sethiroth, and he uses this against the weapon, destroying it. In fact, the beam from the cannon is so powerful it goes all the way to the North Crater and destroys part of Sethiroth's barricade, which is, you know, handy. And in the chaos of the cannon blast, Rufus is seemingly killed by the weapon as it dies. In his wake, the mad Dr. Hojo takes command of the giant cannon, and Cloud and his team hustle to stop him before he blows half of Midgar up. When they confront him, they learn that he's Sethiroth's biological father, which makes the devious bastard responsible for, well, a good chunk of the mess the world is in. And with Hojo cut down to size, Final Fantasy VII nears its endgame. With the meteor close to destroying the planet, Cloud rallies his troops and asks them to consider what they're all personally fighting for. And after a night of soul searching, the team set off for the North Crater to take the fight to Sethiroth one last time. The party descend deep into the crater site and fight off Sethiroth in a host of climactic battles, one with a version near enough to the mad soldier's ambitions of becoming a god. And while the team is able to overcome Sethiroth, they're too late to save the planet. As his power weakens, Holy is released, but not with enough time or power to stop the meteor from striking down on Midgar. As Midgar is destroyed, there's one last Hail Mary from the spirit of Aerith, who gives Holy just enough power to send the meteor away from Gaia and be destroyed. And while it's breaking the chronology of my timeline, FF7 actually ends with a little epilogue, which shows Red 13 surveying the ruins of Midgar amidst a healed Gaia nearly 500 years later. What a ride that was. Right, we are now entering a post-Final Fantasy VII world, and no, I don't mean we've travelled five centuries into the future. In fact, we've jumped forward only two short years for the events of the tie-in movie Advent Children. The world is still reeling from the catastrophic events of FF7, and to make matters worse, a new disease known as Geostigma is tearing through the population. Rufus Shinra, who, surprise surprise, isn't dead, reaches out to the now-retired members of Avalanche in a bid to help curtail the outbreak. And he kickstarts this mission by dispatching a team to the North Crater to locate Genova's severed head, which he believes is the cause of Geostigma. Meanwhile, Cloud Strife, who's secretly infected with the disease, has distanced himself from his friends, and has fallen into a deep depression as a result of the death of Aerith and Zack. Oh, and there's a hostile force known as the remnants of Sethiroth knocking about as well, who are attempting to resurrect the dead villain for nefarious world-conquering reasons. In short, the world is not a happy place post Final Fantasy VII. The remnants, led by a lad called Kadaj, put in motion their plan and they start by recruiting children who are infected with Geostigma, who they make drink the waters of the livestream which they have basically poisoned. This will all become clearer in a little while. They tempt the poor kids with chat about a cure, which is obviously bollocks, and when Cloud attempts to rescue them, the brainwashed tots nearly overpower him. Fortunately, he's rescued by his old mate Vincent Valentine, who imparts some sage wisdom to Cloud about letting go of the past, and Cloud heeds his words. Cloud also encounters a vision of Aerith, who has now become a spirit of sorts within the planet's livestream, and she also encourages Cloud to move on from his past. Start living in the moment, Cloud, old boy. Anyway, Kadaj eventually locates the remains of Genova, which have been in the possession of Rufus Shinra all along. 
Kanaj overpowers Rufus and fuses himself with Jenova's remains, and he sacrifices himself to bring Setheroth back as a living being. With the bad lad back in town, the old take over the world plan is sprung, and Setheroth uses his brainwashed army of disease ridden children to try and destabilise the planet with negative livestream. A big climactic battle between Cloud and Setheroth kicks off, and Setheroth pretty much overpowers our blonde hero by impaling him. In this crucial moment, Cloud is visited by the spirit of Zack, who implores him to fight on by telling him that he has defeated Setheroth once before. Cloud reaches inside himself the willpower to overcome his old adversary, and he eventually defeats Setheroth. And with Setheroth gone, a healing rain courtesy of Aerith falls across the land, curing the people of Geostigma, including those poor brainwashed kids as well. But there's one last twist. The two remaining remnants ambush Cloud and shoot him before they blow themselves up. Cloud follows the great white light to the above and meets both Aerith and Zack who tell him that his time to join them has not yet come. And with those words he wakes back up in Aerith's flower filled church with a newfound positive outlook on his life. <laughs> Next up on the timeline is our final stop before we barrel on into the remake continuity, and that's the third person shooter, Dirge of Cerberus. Hello Dora. You really want to appear in this video, don't you? While the opening of the game takes place during the climax of Final Fantasy VII and sees Vincent, Valentine and Yuffie evacuating Midgar, the bulk of Dirge of Cerberus actually takes place three years after FF7. Here, Gaia is faced with another crisis, this time in the form of Deep Ground, which is another Shinra elite fighting force. As you can probably guess, their intentions aren't exactly noble, and they plan to awaken one of the planet's remaining weapons, Omega, whose function is to absorb all that tasty livestream and transport it away to a new home on another planet. As the main character of the game, Vincent comes into play as he's in control of the Yin to Omega's Yang, a power that is known as Chaos, which according to ancient scriptures is intrinsically linked to Omega, although no one quite knows how or why. Anyway, Vincent dives back into his own history for the answers and we learn that the Chaos Gene was injected into his body 30 years ago while he was acting as Lucrecia Crescent's bodyguard during her time working for Dr. Hojo. Travelling back to her Nibelheim lab, he discovers that he's in possession of something known as the Proto-Materia, which helps him control the chaos burning away inside him. Well, that is until it's stolen by one of the Deep Ground's operatives. It turns out that Deep Ground needs the Proto-Materia for exactly the same reason that Vincent needs it, to control the Omega weapon when they awaken it. Anyway, Vincent is saved by Yuffie and the pair head back to the HQ of the World Regenesis Organization, or WRO, who are presumably having a tough time as of late. Anyway, to cut a long story short, Deep Ground is successful in awakening Omega when their leader, Vice the Immaculate, who's actually possessed by the consciousness of our old mate Dr. Hojo, who seemingly uploaded his consciousness to the network before he died, okay, fuses with Omega in the same way that Vincent is fused with Chaos. While the WRO fight off the Deep Ground forces, Vincent and Omega fight to the bloody death. And when Omega grows wings, must have been on the Red Bull, and makes to flee the planet, Vincent destroys the weapon and vice once and for all. And in a secret ending, we learn that the elite fighting forces of Deep Ground were actually born out of the DNA of first class soldier Genesis. Yep, the lad that was last seen being carted off by two mysterious soldiers at the end of Crisis Core. Deep Ground gave him the code name of G, and set about creating an army of enhanced soldiers in his image. Only when old Genesis woke up, he wasn't best pleased. And in the secret ending of Dirge of Cerberus, we see him wake up once again with a desire to defend the planet. Good on him, I say. You gotta love a redemption story. Right, now it's time to reset back to the events of the original Final Fantasy VII for the remake continuity, which makes a fair few diversions from the original timeline. Remake, which kickstarts a new trilogy based on the events of Final Fantasy VII, ostensibly retells everything that happened during the Midgar section of the original game, namely Avalanche's attempts to cripple Shinra's Mako reactors and Shinra's subsequent counter-attacks against the eco-terrorists. Only Remake switches up some of the details and vastly expands the story as a result. I won't go through the story beat for beat as it largely follows the path of the original game's narrative which I've already regaled, but what I will focus on instead though is how Remake changes up things to create a new timeline strand. The themes of destiny and fate hang heavy over the events of Final Fantasy VII Remake, and they're encapsulated in the form of the Whispers, ghostly spirits that zip around the world and cause the main cast a whole heap of trouble. 
These unfriendly looking wraiths are the Guardians of Fate, and are tasked with ensuring that the natural order of destiny happens as it is intended to, greatly alluding to the events of the original game's timeline. Namely, they protect Cloud during his fall down to the Sector 5 slums, injure Jesse before a bombing mission, meaning Cloud is forced to go instead, and crucially bring Barrett back to life after he's killed by Sephiroth in the game's climax. The Whispers are eventually defeated by the party during the game's final moments, which heavily hints at the remake trilogy altering the original game's timeline. Naturally, there are several other key moments that deviate from the original game, namely Avalanche's expanded scale within the remake timeline and Shinra's sneaky ulterior motives during the course of the game. You see, it turns out that Shinra are actually responsible for blowing up the Marco reactor during the iconic opening as they're spying on Avalanche's plans. They even publicly broadcast one of Avalanche's missions to the Midgar public in a bid to scapegoat them. Their intentions in the remake timeline are to spread the message that Avalanche are in league with Wutai in a ploy to trigger another war with the rebellious nation. Because as much as I hate to say it, war pays the big bucks kids. On top of all of this, Sethiroth gets a much bigger role in Remake than he did during the Midgar sections of the original game. He's seen at several different points in the game goading and haunting poor Cloud with several visions that appear to be set during the burning of Nibelheim. Of course, he also crops up as the game's final boss, because why not? And sets about spewing a healthy dose of intriguing yet confusing statements. In an extended sequence where he whisks Cloud off to an area that he calls the Edge of Creation, he implores our blonde hero to join him in his attempts to defy fate, which Cloud naturally refuses. As a result, Sethiroth defeats Cloud in battle but spares his life, leaving him with the cryptic message that he has 7 seconds before the end. But eclipsing all of this is perhaps the revelation that Zack Fair is actually alive in the remake timeline, or perhaps even an alternate timeline within the remake timeline. Yeah, Cloud's old mate is witnessed surviving his final stand against the Shinra forces, and is seen making his way to Midgar with Cloud. There's even a moment where Zack and Aerith appear to clock one another, which offers up plenty of interesting new storylines. Naturally, Cloud's character development, which was heavily tied to Zack's backstory in the original timeline, is taking a completely different route within the remake continuity. All of which brings us to the uncharted territory of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and mark this as your spoiler warning if you haven't played the game already, as I'm about to jump right in. Yep, all bets are off for the events of Rebirth, which largely charts the same path as the middle acts of the original game, pretty much up to that fateful encounter between Aerith and Sethiroth. You know the one. So we get the gang coming together, including vampire emo Vincent Valentine, robot feline Kate Sith, and everyone's favourite pilot Sid Highwind. And we get the hunt for the various materia, that will presumably lay the foundations for the third game in the remake trilogy. But naturally, Rebirth rings in a whole host of diversions to the established order of events, and a good deal of it is again courtesy of our old pals the Whispers. Rebirth expands on these ghostly beings to reveal that there are dark and light flavours of the spirits, with the Light Whispers trying to course correct the timeline to the events of the original, and the Dark Whispers supposedly working in league with Sethiroth to reap chaos across the lands of Gaia. All of this naturally leads to that fateful ending confrontation, and chaos sure does win out. As this iconic scene plays out in Rebirth, Aerith is surrounded by whispers who largely hold Cloud at bay as he attempts to save her. Only right at the last moment, as Sethiroth's crucial killing blow is about to land, he's able to break free and deflect the blade of Masamune, sending it flying off. And with that, you'd think Rebirth has rewritten the course of Aerith's fate, only things are not that simple. You see, there is a lot going on within this funky new world of Final Fantasy VII, not least the existence of alternate timelines slash universes slash whatever you want to call them. This was hinted at in the last game, where we saw Zack survive his own fateful encounter within a separate universe. And to make matters even more confusing, there's more than two timelines at play here. Yep, we've effectively got another multiverse on our hands here, pals. Sethiroth is naturally at the heart of it all, and his end goal is largely the same as the original game. Use the Black Materia to summon a meteor down to Earth, hoover up all the livestream and become a god. Only now he plans to do that across multiple universes. Anyway, back to Aerith's fate, which, well, kind of sums up a lot of the confusion around these multiple universes and timelines. Basically, we witness several different versions of Aerith's destiny, one in which she dies, one in which she lives, and a few in between, all of which further confuses which outcome is the actual true outcome. Amidst all of this, the Light Whispers are circling Aerith like vultures, which points to the idea that fate is starting to get itself back on track. 
It doesn't help that poor Cloud is really suffering in Rebirth, as a result of a lot of universe hopping, more on that in just a second. And then there's bloody Sethiroth and his confusing monologuing, stating that several different worlds are converging into one within this moment. Yeah, it's all a bit of a head scratcher. All of this is further obfuscated during the fallout after the climatic boss battle where only Cloud can see Aerith still alive, while the rest of the party mourns her death. The likely answer to this is that Aerith is now a force ghost of sorts, which kind of ties back to the original game I guess, but it might also point to the fact that Aerith is still alive in other universes, namely Zack's timeline for starters. But what makes this even more confusing is that while we get a convergence of these two timelines during the climactic battle, with Zack and Cloud actually fighting alongside one another, Zack clearly departs back to his own timeline, while Aerith is left alone in this one with only Cloud being able to see her. Regardless, it's clear that there are several Aeriths across several universes, as evidence when Cloud is pulled into another reality by one of the Aeriths who bestows him with her white materia. Anyway, I'm getting a headache thinking about it all. Zack, meanwhile, is left with a dangling thread of hope, as his reunion with Cloud in the main universe has given him a new ambition to bring the universes back together once more, so he can be with his friends again, largely because they're out for the count in his own timeline. Anyway, Rebirth finishes with Cloud and the team flying off to track down Sethiroth, with poor old Aerith watching them from the ground. And if you want more of a deep dive into this mad ending, we'll have a comprehensive breakdown on our channel for you to check out. And that, friends, is the Final Fantasy VII timeline fully explained. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the Square's iconic RPG franchise, and if you like these kinds of gaming timeline videos, we've got plenty up on the channel right now, including Prince of Persia, Silent Hill, and Metal Gear Solid. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.